Thank you, Kelly, and uh, thank you, Vince, Emily, and Daniel, and all of the uh, Buddhist Geeks people. It's, it's really a pleasure to, to be here this morning. Um, before we get started, I wanted to prove my geek. <laughs> this is from my third trip to uh, Tibet. Uh, this is uh, uh, Rinpoche uh, in Kham, and uh, he, he was really intrigued with the Buddhist Geek shirt, so Vince, you made it to Tibet. <laughs> I'm nervous. Uh, there's a little imposter syndrome voice going on in my head that says, uh, who are you to talk to these folks about Buddhism? You don't know anything about it. In fact, the voice is now saying, what the heck are you doing to these people telling them that this is going on? <laughs> I'm also happy. I'm really happy to be here. There are a few friends in the audience and a few new friends. Um, I've been a fan of Buddhist Geeks for a long time. And uh, I consider myself, I consider it an honor to really support Buddhist Geeks. Um, I also wanted to make the point that I really do have my credibility. I have both a mala and a Fitbit flex. <laughs> Fuck yeah! I also wanted to warn you, I'm from Brooklyn, so I curse. <laughs> and usually the second half of the joke of that is, and if you don't like it, fuck you. <laughs> For those of you who are tempted to tweet and play with your devices, this is my handle. You're more than welcome to tweet, only if you use this hashtag. <laughs> Got it? He, and he's copying it down. I just... Geek! Geek! All right, let's get our geek on. I'm going to make a proposition. And, and that is that in the effort to create organizations that are generative as well as financially successful, because guess what, folks? We need both. Delusion, both at the self-level and the collective level, is the surest guarantee of failure. Now, this comes from about 25 years of observing startups, nonprofits, for-profits, public companies, non-public, private companies, and most specifically from my most recent work as a coach. Delusion, self-delusion and collective delusion is the surest guarantee of failure. And I don't mean this kind of delusion. Take a minute. I'm not delusional, I'm an entrepreneur. I mean the kind of delusion that denies reality. And I'm going to tell you a story. And by the way, this is where the imposter syndrome starts to kick in. Because I'm going to tell you a Buddhist story. You know that badass Buddhist saint, Milarepa? Right? He's really badass. I love him. So there's a story about Milarepa. Milarepa, as many of you know, spent 20 years or so meditating in a cave. And one day he left the cave to, carry, to gather firewood. And he came back from that process, from gathering the firewood, and the cave was filled with demons. Right? And we know what demons mean, right? Difficult emotions, challenging mental states. So he does what any right-thinking person starts to do. He starts to bat them away. Get out, get out. And what happens? Nothing. It doesn't work. So then he gets the bright idea. Ah, I'll teach them the Dharma. And they all sit down and start listening to him teach, listen, teach the Dharma. And I like to think of them as little children. But again, nothing really happens. Right? The number of demons stays the same. So then he gets the more clever idea of asking them, 
What are you here to teach me? And one by one, they start to disappear. Except for one. And the one that remains is a big, blood-curdling, hairy, mother-effer of a demon. (laughs) Who said, and to that demon, he puts his head up to the mouth of the demon and he says, eat me if you wish. And the demon disappears. Now when I first read this story, it was obvious to me this was about business. (laughs) It's about leadership. It's about, you know, all the work I'd done in 20 years of psychoanalysis. Right? Nothing to do with the Dharma. But then I started thinking, what did it really have to do with me? What was my big, hairy demon? I used to be a venture capitalist. You can blame me for all those damn ads you see on the internet. Or as I like to tell my daughter, the reason I invented the internet is I don't like to go shopping. (laughs) And in 2002, I was suicidally depressed. I was running the Olympic bid committee for New York City. I had made more money than my children could possibly spend. And I was empty. I was hollow. I was hollowed out. I walked out of an Olympic bid committee meeting, stood in front of Ground Zero, because we had free office space, because nobody wanted to work downtown at that time. Then the pile was still smoldering. And I wanted to jump in front of a subway. And I called my therapist, and I said, it's back. And she said, get in a cab. Fuck. You know, I, can, I, I struggled to get through this story without tearing up. And she said, come, come in. We had a long conversation. And I began dealing with a demon. And the demon was, I'm not good enough. Simple, right? How many people have that demon? (sighs) Fuck. I'm not lovable enough. Doesn't matter how well off my children will be, I am not a good enough father. I'm not a good enough parent, a husband, a child. I'm not worthy of being loved. The only thing that would make me being loved enough, my therapist got me to admit, was if I had as much money as Bill Gates. (laughs) now you see why I was in therapy still am I had to confront that demon who is still with me today who is part of the imposter syndrome that said I'm not good enough to stand up in front of you guys I had to confront it. Because if I didn't, and this is from the Gnostic Gospels, the cool Gospels. (laughs) The rebel Gospels, damn it! I'm a uh, uh, reformed Catholic. And... uh, Recovering Catholic. I took my Buddhist refuge vows on Mother's Day. Uh, And my Italian-American mother in Brooklyn went to the pastor and said, It's devil worship! And I said, That's right, Ma. But Jesus' wisdom spoke to me. If you bring forth what is in you, what is in you will save you. If you do not bring forth what is in you, what is in you will destroy you. What is in me are demons. What's in you, and you, and you, and you, and you. Milarepanu. Eat me if you wish. So what does this have to do with business? Business. 
Fear of uncertainty traps us. We know this. I will argue that fear of uncertainty traps us in a particular way because it undermines our sense of who we are. Ten minutes. Got it. <laughs> fear of uncertainty causes this expectation of infallibility. How many people here lead an organization of some sort? You know that feeling? I'm supposed to have all the answers. You know that feeling that the people you work with project onto you? You're supposed to have all the answers? A good friend and brilliant writer, plugging for his books, Parker Palmer, calls it functional atheism. You as the leader think you're supposed to know everything. You as the leader think that you're supposed to have all the answers. I think this annihilates the self. Now, just to pause, I was talking to, this is kind of cool to say out loud, Pema Chodron. <laughs> She's my bud. And I said, you know, it creates this sort of annihilation of self. And she said, oh, you mean in a bad way. <laughs> I was like, yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> I often use the term violent. Because what it does is it forces us to deny the reality of who we are. Which is that we don't have a fucking clue what to do half the time. <laughs> Imagine if we had a president who said, damned if I knew. <laughs> thought there were weapons of mass destruction. Dick, didn't you tell me there were weapons of mass destruction? <laughs> right? France, Italy, give me a hand. I broke something. And I gotta fix it. Now, it's easy to make fun of George Bush. So easy. <laughs> what will we do when he's gone? I mean, really gone. But, how would you react if a president got on television and said, I don't know? How would you react if he said, this recession is really, really hard, and I don't know what to do? Really, look inside yourself. You know that little kid inside of you that says, Mommy, Daddy, what should I do? Or those employees who say, just tell me what to do. How about that part of you that says, just tell me what to do? This is a two-way street, this functional atheism. It's not just out-of-control narcissists. Yes, that is true. But it's also what we project onto our leaders. I used to teach a class in college, and I used to have the students read, or let me... Amend that. I used to attempt to have the students read Plato's Republic <laughs> and Machiavelli's The Prince. They lied. I dealt with the reality of that. So then I would summarize it and then we would discuss it. <laughs> Anybody teach? You know what I mean, right? <laughs> and I used to say that we talk about wanting Plato's philosopher king as our leader, but we constantly elect the prince. Always. What's up with that? Why do we do that? How do we get past this process? By the way, I, this is a, normally a, like a three hour talk. It takes 20 minutes for me to clear my throat, so this is tough. <laughs> so I'm just moving along. Come on, you got you with me? Got it. Okay. How do we overcome this? Being friendly with our personal demons. What was that crazy little thing I did at the start of the talk? I landed. Did it help you? And it helped me. And we got to be human together. What if you as a leader, have we got five minutes? What if you as a leader stood up in front of your group and said, I got these issues. 
They stem from childhood. <laughs> all right, all right. I've been in psychoanalysis for way too long. But I had a coaching client a few months ago who said to me, you know, he's, uh, many of my clients are first-time entrepreneurs, first-time CEOs of tech startups. That's, that's the geek side of what I do. And they said, uh, you know, they failed. They thought they were going to raise money, and, and they failed to raise money. He said, what do I do? How, what do I tell the staff? I said, how about the truth? But what if they all run away? What if they quit? What if they stop believing in me? I said, would you rather have them believe in you because you lied? Because you're deluded? Because you're deceptive? I know, I know you're taking care of their feelings. Slippery slope. Slippery slope to annihilation. Being fearless and naming those dreaming. Accepting reality without giving up. Living in what Parker Palmer calls the tragic gap. Ed and I were talking about this last night. How do you hold on to hope when you know that you will fail? In my limited experience, the most impossible organization to begin to, to create is a startup, nonprofit and for profit. You want to change the world? Good luck. And I'm with you. And to me, Dharma teaches us to live in that gap of hope without attachment. To believe that you can take on an entrenched institution, power structure, knowing 99.99% of the enterprises fail, and you get up and you do it anyway. Working with your own triggers that arise as a result of our wish to change reality. How many Buddhist teachers have taught us that most suffering stems from our wish to change reality? I don't like this life. I want that one. Too bad. Now what are you going to do? This is your life. This is your business. This is your enterprise. This is your undertaking. This is your karma. What are you going to do? That being so, so what? Creating conditions in which the whole team can work with reality as it is. One of my client companies has something they call the blameless post-mortem. And of course, the most important piece of that is the blameless part. Can you actually work within the team to diagnose a problem without blame? And by the way, without blaming yourself either. Because, you know, us codependent types, we like to take on responsibility for everybody's problems. You're uncomfortable? Sorry. I should have brought better chairs. I've got a group therapy group I go to once a week, and six of the therapists, boy, that's fun. <laughs> And invariably, you know, all this transference is showing up and everybody's fighting with everybody. And Marty, my nemesis in the group, likes to turn to me and go, do you feel guilty yet? We're all fighting. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's my fault. I'm going to violate one of the Zen presentation rules by reading a lot. Organizations require an approach to suffering that is fundamentally a reflection of the Four Noble Truths. Dealing with, the darm, dealing with the uncertainty, I have found nothing. I have found no wisdom tradition. And I've read everything that you can possibly read from the Harvard Business Review Press. I found nothing that is more powerful than the Dharma. I teach this to my clients. I don't tell them it's the Dharma. That's okay. <laughs> they don't need to know. Vince and I were talking about this talk, and he said, what if impact do you think mindfulness has? And I said, mindfulness changes an organization. It breaks down our tendencies towards our own infantilization. When we are complicit in the process of denying our capacity to deal with change. 
to deal with the randomness of the world. Is that my time? No. Okay, two seconds. This is the last slide. Tools that enhance our mindful awareness further the ability of an organization to become what I think is really the opportunity for all of us, a crucible. You thought the purpose of business was to replicate itself. Yeah, sort of. It's kind of like the Borg. <laughs> yes! Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm taking 10 seconds. <laughs> the Borg is Google. No, no, the Borg is Apple. The Klingons are Microsoft. <laughs> now I'm really going to test the geekiness. The Dominion is Google. <laughs> They're the ones you really got to watch. Tools that enhance a mindful awareness further the ability for the process of what work is supposed to be. Work is not merely the means to that first level of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, food, shelter, clothing. It's about becoming more of ourselves. That's our karma. And that, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs>